Alright, so Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, good afternoon. So, first of all, all Happy New Year to everyone. Um, I hope that everybody now is safe um, so from all this new flooding that is going on. Um, right, so now we are on our 11th week. Uh, we still have a few more weeks left before the end of the semester. And um, as you have, uh, uh, as I have told you guys previously, um, you will have your final exam for this course, um, at least for my section on the, um, somewhere in February, I can't remember the exact date, okay? So it will be somewhere in February, um, kind of second is early February. So we still have about three lecture slots left, excluding this one. And then uh, for one of them, we will use for quiz. We can use one of the other slot to discuss about the quiz. And we have one empty slot because today my plan is for, for us to finish up all the materials. Okay. Right. So let's get into it. And um, if we do have enough time, then we will um, do something else. But otherwise, uh, we'll just finish the lecture slot first. Then we will we'll discuss on what we well, what you guys want to do next week. All right. So, um, so these are the lecture outline that I've given to you guys. I presented last um, from, from the beginning of the semester. And we've pretty much covered every single thing. Um, and uh, what is left is just um, on the module number three or uh, subchapter number three, which is biotechnological or cellular. So we're going to look into this in a, in a while. And um, what you, the, the content is more or less like some that has been covered initially, but uh, especially in, in our first lecture, but um, we're going to go into a bit more detail uh, this time around. Okay, so um, the first one that, that the, the first slide for this, uh, for today's lecture, is more on like how uh, an overview. Okay, so Imagine if you are a chemist and, and you need to do a few reactions um, to achieve your goal. So in this case, initially, you have um, an um, acid as I shown here. Okay? And then towards the end of the day, what you want is you want to convert from the uh, acid into a fat. Okay? So you do know from a simple acid like that, and if you want to convert it into a fat uh, based on... Uh, the fat lectures that you have probably gone through, and you know that fat structure is a bit more complex. Um, it consists of glycerol and fatty acids. So how do you convert a very simple acid like this into a fatty acid? So you can do that. And there are various enzymes, um, at least in our body, if you think about it, um, how do our body produces fats? And one of them is by going through all these processes and you can see here that each process has an enzyme that does a, a certain function. Okay, but if uh, if you're thinking about uh, what we've covered last week or, or two weeks ago, last week, yes, okay, what we've covered last week, um, in the sense that if you produce a protein or, or enzyme for that matter, um, the purification process takes a while, right? So. Imagine in this particular scenario where you have five different enzymes and each enzyme you need to express, you need to purify, you need to do all the um, um, centrifugation, um, getting all the uh, pellets and then we dissolve it and then perhaps you need to repurify using um, either the simplest ones is uh, polyhistidine tag purification or um, any column, or even if you want to use the magnetic um, um, technology. Okay? If you were to do that for just a simple reaction like this, it, it might take a while, right? So to purify it is one thing. And then for each process from one ingredient to another ingredient, of course, each step requires a purification step. Therefore, for you to do these five steps, it might take a while, right? A long time pretty much so um 
it, it will be too much work to actually do it. If you are in chemistry building, like if, if you're working as an RA, um, in, in our chemistry building or even in industry, for you to do all these steps, it will take a while, it will take a long, long time. So for, um, so the, the question that I pose here, just to kind of like, you know, um, give an overview of this is, isn't it too much work to purify a product after each step before proceeding to the next step? So for one thing, you need to purify the enzyme itself. And then for the second thing, you need to purify the product. Even if you say, uh, but you can always purchase the proteins or enzymes. Yes, you are correct. But at the end of the day, if you were to do the reaction, you always need to, you know, purify. Um, well, if you say no, you are a true chemist. Um, but in my case, uh, myself, I don't really prefer to do a purification, especially for a tedious reaction like this. And for me, I don't really like to do column multiple times um, because it's just, for me, it's wasting of time. Um, I, I would prefer to use HPLC to do all the purification. Um, but towards the end of the day, there's a lot of work involved. Um, and thus, you can actually use cell to help you to kind of like, um, instead of doing five reaction, and just do a single reaction from the initial product to the final product okay so you can do that and you can use enzyme uh, cells instead of enzyme but of course it's not as easy as it sounds because for one thing you need to think about what is the source of the cell whether the cell itself um, contains all these enzymes okay, that you require to produce this specific um, glycolipids or, or fats that you want okay so uh, there are different types of lipids, there's multiple types of lipids. So if that is the product of interest, then you need to make sure that the cell contains all these enzymes. Okay, so that to then you can get the product of interest. So um, therefore we need to look into cells a little bit and to understand what can you do with it and what are the limitations in terms of using in vivo technology to produce um, a product of interest, obviously using enzymes. Okay. So what you need to know, um, you, you do need to know about cells a little bit to understand how cell functions and what can you do to actually modify the cells so that it does what you want it to do. Okay. Um, this field itself is very huge. So there's multiple things that you can do. And if you actually go into, um, say, Google Scholar and find um, enzyme production or cell assay work, uh, cellular work to produce uh, certain enzyme or product, you can actually see a lot of uh, uh, publications, a lot of uh, pretty much knowledge. Okay, so this lecture, what we're gonna go through today, uh, will limit to the basic. So the basic understanding on uh, what are the things that you can modify, but not into very detail that you uh, need to memorize every single things that that you need to do uh, or you need to modify for. Uh, purpose of the reaction that I've shown in the previous slide. Okay, um, and what we we'll go through afterwards is just a basic comparison between a biochemical, meaning that you are using the enzyme manually one by one, um, and the current cellular approach. Okay, it's just a brief um, kind of like um, what do call it comparison. Okay, so uh, in terms of cell, I think I've covered it a little bit, but we'll just do a refresher. Okay. So over here is what we call as the nucleus. And this nucleus contains the genetic information that uh, is very critical in the sense that uh, if the genetic material does not contain uh, the information of the enzyme of interest, okay, so definitely the cell cannot do the process of interest that you want. If, for example, if you think about, we'll just focus on this, okay, phosphorylation. Um, of course, all cells have phosphorylation, so obviously they do have this enzyme. But imagine, just for the sake of um, learning purposes, okay, imagine if the cell does not have the EC65XX um, enzyme that does a phosphorylation. So it doesn't have the genetic material, the nucleus about this particular enzyme. Okay, So definitely, um, if you use that particular cell for the phosphorylation process, it will not work. 
Why? Because the, the cell cannot produce the enzyme that does the phosphorylation, okay, basic concept. So you need to have the genetic material so that you can, the cell can produce the enzyme of interest and then the enzyme of interest can do the process um, of interest, the process that you want. Okay? So you need to have that for one thing. Okay? And then for the second thing, you need to know the phosphorylation process, whether it takes place inside of the enzyme or outside of the enzyme. So there are two types of enzymes or two categories, not two types, uh, two, more on two categories of enzyme. One is what we call as intracellular enzyme. And the other one is extracellular enzyme. Okay. So the difference is intra means inside. So one enzyme works inside of the cell itself. One is extracellular, meaning that the enzyme is being created inside the cell and then be transported outside of the cell. Okay. So these are the two categories. And definitely um, for you to, to know the process of interest. And from there, you need to know whether the enzyme is uh, working intracellular or extracellular. So why does it matter? Well, because for one thing, um, if it's an extracellular, that will be very easy. So sometimes it's very easy to do it. So you need to have your reagent, whatever you want, and then you can just put the cell together with the reagent, mix it well, because you know that towards the end of the day, the cell is going to um, produce the enzyme and then uh, transfer it outside of the cell. And then that is where the reaction will take place. Okay. However, if it's an intracellular, then you need to make sure that there is a compatibility between the reagents or the reactants that you put in. Uh, for one thing, make sure that it's not toxic, that it doesn't kill the cell. And then the second thing is you need to make sure that the reactant itself can enter the cell so that the enzyme inside the cell can catalyze the reaction. Okay. So um, again, this is kind of like, you know, you might think about like, uh, I think I've heard something like this before. Because, yes, we did cover about that. Okay, so that's the slide that I'm going to put um, afterwards. So um, this is, as I mentioned, you need to know where is the enzyme located. Either it's extracellular or intracellular. Um, and for the sake of doing a multiple reactions, then intracellular might be better. Okay, because you know um, all the enzymes are inside the cell. So as long as you can get your reactant inside the cell, that it can catalyze all the processes. Okay? So that's why I said intracellular might be better. Again, it might be better because um, for all you know, one of the um, uh, intermediates are toxic to the cell. We don't know. Okay? Um, that does, there's, there's a lot of uh, investigation that in, needs to be done for uh, to ensure that the intermediates are not toxic. But of course, um, the process of producing fats in our cells are relatively safe uh, because our cell itself are made up of protein. So, um, but in case in the future you are thinking about producing a very unique type of fats, then you do need to do a lot of investigation and, and check on all the um, intermediates, make sure they are not toxic to the cells and that the cells can actually produce and move um, the processes from one enzyme to another. Okay, so um, therefore, if you want to do a reaction, which path should you choose? Should you choose the intracellular or extracellular? The answer towards the end, as I mentioned, depends on the location. So you need to know what you want to do so that you can decide on what type of enzyme you want to do and what type of modification of this on the cell that you might need to take in order for you to produce um, the ultimate goal of producing the product of interest. Okay. So um, location of enzyme, um, again, extracellular, intracellular. So for extracellular, okay, so normally it will be a very simple enzyme isolation because you know that the cell have uh, will produce the enzyme, uh, all genetic materials from here, uh, going to the um, uh, restriction enzyme, and then it's uh, not restriction enzyme, uh, ER complex, uh, endoplasmic reticulum, okay, endoplasmic reticulum, and then from there it will go to the Golgi apparatus, um, and from the Golgi apparatus, it can actually be transported outside of the cell, okay. So if the enzyme are outside of the cell, then it will be very easy, it's very simple, you can just take the reactant, add in, in, um, in a beaker, for example, well, put the enzyme in, or you can just mix them together, 
then towards the end of the day, you can get your product. Okay, you get your product. It's very straightforward. But for interest cellular, it will be more tedious. There will be no easy isolation of the technique. Um, and of course, in a cell, there's multiple types of enzyme. So even if you, you do know uh, that the cell contains all five enzymes of interest, okay, but you do not know what will happen when you produce your product. Okay? There could be a fifth enzyme that does something to your product. Okay? So that's why I say it's tedious and therefore there is no easy isolation. Of course, with optimization and whatnot, well, everything can be simple. Not easy, but simple in the sense that to the other day, you can get the product of interest. Okay? Um, for extracellular, typically the enzyme is low selectivity. Um, no restriction requirement to use um, cellular. So what do I mean by that is because in the cell itself, there's a lot of regulation. Okay? Cell, our cell is very complex. There's a lot of regulation, um, meaning that even if you do know an enzyme is inside the cell, the enzyme might not be active. Okay? So there might be a certain condition that your, your cell needs to fulfill before the enzyme can actually be active. Okay? Uh, for example, uh, you know our insulin, right? So insulin, um, the, the enzyme that, we, that, that I normally use in this case, insulin, you know that it converts your glucose into glucagon. Okay? So glucagon is a type of uh, storage uh, because you know glucose is a very simple uh, structure, it's a very simple um, uh, sugar, carbohydrate. So if it's not needed, so the cell will convert it into glucagon using insulin. Okay? However, imagine if insulin is out of control. It's always there. Um, um, thus, and, and you do know that the glucose is needed to produce energy. Okay? While glucagon cannot produce energy directly, it must be converted to glucose first, and then the glucose will be converted uh, to produce ATP and whatnot to produce as an energy for the cells. Okay? So imagine if there is no mechanism of control for the insulin, then of course, if there's any insulin in the cell, it will always be converted into glucagon. And to the end of the day, there's no energy molecule and your cell will die. Okay? So there must be a control mechanism that either activates or deactivates the enzyme. So in the same case here, um, when, when I say no restriction for extracellular, because it's outside of the cell. So normally it doesn't really affect the cell itself. Well, of course, when you're talking about intracellular, there are still requirements such as pH and temperature as what we've covered previously. Okay? So there are still requirements, but the requirements are not as tedious or as complex as um, if you actually want to do the process inside of a cell. Okay? So um, therefore, it's low selectivity. Okay? Again, if you think about the bell curve, the uh, enzyme activity uh, with respect to um, changes in pH or changes in temperature, then you do know that it's not really specific. You can do, you know, there's, there's a slight um, leeway by which you can play around. Okay? But for intracellular, so normally it's highly selective because you don't want the enzyme, um, if, if say, I am a cell, right? So if I were to produce an enzyme, I want it to be selective to one particular process so that it will not affect another process. Okay. So insulin, if it's in my body, I want insulin to only work on glucose and not working on glucagon and producing something else. Okay. So I hope with that you, you can understand a little bit on uh, what I do. I mean by potentially high selectivity. So, um, okay. so in vitro environment might not be suitable. So this is another reason. Uh, in vitro uh, environment might not be suitable. Of course, you can always do it. You can always adjust it. But in general, it might not be suitable. Especially because if the enzyme is produced in the cytoplasm, okay, cytoplasm, uh, the pH is just slightly acidic, not very acidic, just slightly acidic, so about pH of 6. Um, but over here, we do have what we call as lysosomes. Okay? So lysosome, it can also be a place by which an enzyme, a very acidic enzyme can take place. So lysosome can, the pH in the lysosome can go down to about 2, uh, a pH of 2 very very acidic pH and then there are some enzymes that are working inside a lysosome instead of um, in the cell uh, per se it, it's working 
in the subset of a, a cell called, called lysosome, and this is where the enzyme actually works. Okay, so for for this enzyme, for example, if you were to take it out and then do it in, as in in vitro, meaning you are doing it outside of the cell, it might not work, especially if you do not know the properties of the enzyme itself. But if you do know that the enzyme works in a acidic environment and whatnot, you can always adjust it so that it will work. Okay, but if you do, if you use the same enzyme in a cell, then the cell will already know about the enzyme and it, it will already do all the um, kind of like adjustment um, so that the enzyme works at the very optimum um, condition. Okay. And then finally, um, extracellular is relatively cheap compared to uh, intracellular because intracellular, you need to control it. Uh, you, you do need to do all the pre-requirement processes as what extracellular uh, as what you need to do for extracellular but then um, you need to do a lot of controls you need to do a lot of optimization before you can actually um, get the cell to work okay why do you need to, to do optimization for one thing you need to make sure that the cell grows okay because if it's extracellular then you know you don't really have to care about whether the cell grow or not as long as the enzyme is being expressed, you can get a high quantity of the enzyme. That is already okay. Okay, but for intracellular, you need to make sure that the cell grow, because without that, without the cell growing, um, there will be a limitation in terms of the number of uh, catalytic processes that you can actually do in one cell. Okay, so say for example, for extracellular, um, the enzyme might express. Um, this is just for sake of argument. A millimolar concentration of the extracellular enzyme. Okay. Because to the end of the day, uh, imagine if you have one cell in a one liter beaker. Okay. So uh, regardless of how many enzymes are being expressed, one millimolar or even one molar, so it will be diluted throughout the uh, bulk solution inside your beaker. But if it's uh, if the cell tries to produce the same quantity, one molar inside the cell, then Either one, there will be no place uh, for the cell to produce a high concentration of enzyme, or number two, the high concentration of enzyme might actually kill the cell itself. Okay, so it will be more expensive to grow the cell uh, for the purpose of asking the cell to do an intracellular uh, well, technology, okay, processes enzymes and whatnot. Right, so uh, this is what I mean. Um, you've, you've seen this slide before during your first lecture where uh, I briefly talk about um, the like uh, processes, um, whether it's extracellular or intracellular. Okay, So fermentation, for example, is an extracellular process. Um, oh, well, it can be an intracellular process, whereby the cell uh, take up the reactant itself, do the process, and then um, excrete it out. Okay. Um, or it can also be something that uh, the enzyme is being expressed extracellularly um, and you can just mix your uh, reactants and then it will just convert it straight away okay so very simple however when you're talking about intracellular what you need to do is you need to play around with genetic so remember the nucleus where i say it contains a lot of genetics so you need to play around with the genetics um, why because perhaps you want to do um, so editing meaning that you want to change the enzyme a little bit we want to change um, the enzyme, um, either changing the whole thing. Or you want to introduce, meaning that the enzyme initially is not native to the cell. Then you want to introduce an, uh, a, a genetic material into the cell, so you need to do the editing. Or um, you want to change the enzyme a little bit so that either it will be more specific or it will be less specific to the um, reactants or regions that you are um, targeting to okay so you if you are to do this then of course it needs genetic technology you need to do some modification similarly even if uh, fermentation is an extracellular you might want to uh, do the editing a little bit um, so that the enzyme that is being produced is optimum to the condition that you want okay all right so um of course, enzyme technology for this one is excluded because we've already covered it in the past few lectures. Okay? So basically, in this case, the enzyme can either be intracellular or extracellular. It doesn't matter. So at the end of the day, you take the enzyme, 
uh, you process it, homogenize and whatnot, uh, centrifuge and purify it so that you can get a pure enzyme. And then you use the pure enzyme uh, outside of the cell or in vitro, in a tube, in a beaker to get your product. Okay? So um, today's lecture is more focusing on the genetic technology. So how do you process? How do you actually do it? So of course, this will be like a very brief, uh, it will not be in very detail. If you are interested in how it is done um, in a very detailed manner, you can always go Google to, to Google Scholar and, and find um, the information. Okay, So um, I, I will not go in very detail because depending on what you want to produce, um, I'm sorry, plan I get them. So depending on what you want to produce, you can do a little bit of modification. Okay, so um, and literature, all the work that has been published can be um, taken into account and can be used to actually produce uh, the product of interest. Okay, all right. So what do I write here? Depending on which option you want to opt for, either genetic manipulation or fermentation. So for fermentation, normally you know the process of interest and the cell does what you want. Okay, so um, a very simple thing is yeast. Okay, for so one example, yeast. So you do know that yeast takes up um, if you want to make a bread. Okay, uh, for those who know how to make pizza or, or, or bread, for that matter, um, I did learn to to make a bread uh, and pizza. Um, so if you know that that uh, in in the bread making process, you need to use um, yeast. Okay. And then yeast feeds on glucose uh, or feeds on the uh, carbohydrates that you want. So the, the flour, for example. Okay? So when you uh, are making, uh, doing the bread making process, you add on yeast, you add on sugar a little bit. So you're kind of like giving the um, yeast some energy. So you know that the yeast, the process itself. Okay? So why do you use yeast? Because you know that yeast will convert the glucose into um carbon dioxide and water okay and the carbon dioxide is the product that you want in bread making okay, so this is an example of bread making why do you want carbon dioxide because you want your bread to have like um uh, what do you call it um like a space uh vo volume void volume kind of like you know um uh, to say in, in the malay language is stronger Okay, so you, you want to, to have a space inside the bread. When you add bread, okay, remember there's there's always like a, a texture inside the bread, right? It's not a plain, like um, if you uh, look at the outside of a bread or outside of pizza, it's normally a smooth surface. But once you break the bread apart, if you look into um, the inside, there's a lot of spaces, right? Like um, bubbles and whatnot, okay? Uh, it's not bubbles. Uh, more like... Uh, Air, air sac, so to say, air sac. Right. So you know that the yeast will do this, and you need the air sac because it will help uh, make sure that the bread is is soft. Okay? So you you do know the process, and the cell in this case yeast does that. So you can use yeast in bread making. So you know the process, you know what the cell is doing, and you just fit in whatever is needed. Okay, so that's an example of fermentation. Of course, you, you can go into um, a different uh, idea, especially if uh, you go into overseas, for example, um, in first world country where they drink a lot of wine. Um, and so fermentation is part of the process that uh, is very uh, kind of like stringent, very tightly controlled so that you can get the Kind of like the best wine um, that they want okay either it's a wine or beer and whatnot okay similarly uh, if you're talking about um, cheese making okay cheese making also um, requires a process a well-known process and a, and a, a type of cell or yeast or whatever it might be to make sure that the it can convert the milk into a kind of like a cheese like uh, structure texture and taste okay so that's a good example of fermentation, okay? Can there be bread making, uh, cheese, or uh, wine? Okay, so these are three examples. Why do I put wine there? Because um, during my time, I actually learned about uh, 
little bit about wine making because uh, I used to study in Australia and um, wine industry in Australia is very huge. Okay? So I did learn a little bit about it, but it doesn't mean that I actually do it. All right. So um, fermentation, the process is very easy, very straightforward. You have the cell, you have the media, uh, you have the region, you mix them together and then you incubate and therefore you produce a product. Okay? At the end of the day, you either isolate it. Uh, in case of wine, you do isolate it um, to make sure that the wine is pure. Um, you might want to control the alcohol content. You might, take, you might want to uh, remove all the other byproducts and whatnot. Okay? For bread and cheese, normally you don't do any isolation. You just eat it as it is. Okay? All right. In terms of genetic manipulation, it will be more complex. Why? Because first, as I mentioned, you need to make sure that the cell contains the gene of interest. Um, so if you go back into the first uh, few slides in this lecture, where we're talking about the EC6.5 uh, that does a phosphorylation process, so you need to know that the cell contains the gene that can be expressed to produce the protein or enzyme that does the phosphorylation. Okay, so that's one thing. So if it does, then you know that it will result in the process of interest. So, so you know that the cell will do the phosphorylation process and the cell um, can, uh, and of course, uh, if say, um, say for example, how do I say this? Yes. Just for the sake of argument, okay? Yeast cannot do phosphorylation. It does, okay? For, for just for the sake of this argument, it can. But say, for example, it cannot do it, okay? So you need to make sure that yeast can actually, is actually compatible with phosphorylation process with enzyme um, EC6.5, okay? If it's not compatible, then either um, EC6.5 will cause a toxicity in the cell and therefore killing the cell, or EC6.5 might not be expressed at all, or even if it's expressed, it might not be activated. So if it's not activated, if it's not expressed, or if it kills a the cell, then you, towards the end of the day, you cannot get your product. Okay? So that's why I say you need to have a gene of interest, you need to know the process of interest, whether the process works or not, and then you need to make sure that the cell is compatible with the uh, process of interest. Uh, and therefore, you can produce the product. That's what I mean by that. So the process, the 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 process itself, if say the gene is not there, will include insertion of a gene into the cell. So if a yeast doesn't have the phosphorylation um, genes, so DNA or RNA for that matter, you need to first make sure that the DNA is being transferred into the cell. Okay. So this is what we call as um, genetic modification. Okay, so if you Google genetic modification, there's there's a lot of um, technology has been developed. Um, especially if you if you try and search for um, gene therapy, so that is the same concept, meaning that uh, you still have the gene gene of interest that you want, and then you want to put it into a cell. Okay, so that it will function um, as you intended. Alright, so insertion of gene into the cell and thus uh, produce a cell of interest. And then the cell of interest can then be used for fermentation process um, so that it will produce the product of interest. Okay? So if the gene is not there, um, you can use the cell but you will not get your product. Okay? So say for example, normally for bread making, again go back to bread making, cheese uh, making or wine making. Okay? So bread making, um, normally, we just use yeast. Uh, there's a few types of yeast, but the common ones that we use is... I can't remember the, the, the name of the yeast on top of my head now. Okay? But generally, what we call is just yeast. If you use that type of yeast, okay, but then the yeast can, uh, cannot actually um, digest our glucose to produce carbon dioxide, for example. So if you still use the yeast, then it will not do anything so you still get your your uh, rigid bread or for example uh, or in another, another concept if say um, you know that the yeast uses um, one type of enzyme for this catalytic process uh, to produce to, to consume glucose and then produce energy and um, carbon dioxide so you want to change the uh, cell the organism so instead of using a yeast 
you want to use an E. coli, okay, so a bacteria instead of yeast. So you can do that, but you need to make sure that the E. coli, the cell of interest that you, you want to use, can have the enzyme of interest, uh, the enzyme that you want, and you can also modify, you can edit it so that the E. coli contains the enzyme of interest. Then when you put the E. coli with your um, uh, flour and whatnot to make bread, then it can get, actually catalyze the process of interest and thus producing the bread um, of a certain category. But of course, normally you will not do uh, food making using E. coli. There's a lot of uh, reason for wanting E. coli can be a very toxic um, organism. Um, depending on the um, cross depending on the E. coli itself. Okay, so um, to the end, once you have the cell of interest, it's the same as the fermentation process previously. So you just mix them together and then you incubate. Um, and during the incubation, the product will be produced. And towards the end of the day, you can isolate the product. Okay, so again, um, this is just to make sure that um, you guys don't think that this is the only way by which you can actually do it. Uh, you can, there's actually multiple ways by which you can actually uh, do, do this step. Okay, all right, so um, now we've covered roughly about. Um, how whether you want to use an enzyme isolated isolated enzyme or you sell to uh, catalyze your your reaction okay so uh, to the end of the day which one is the best which one is better so what are the differences um, and this table table 1.2 kind of like uh, briefly um, generalize or summarizes the pro and cons of using an isolated enzyme versus a whole cell system okay so um you can see here isolated whole cell so in terms of isolated it can be in any form uh, meaning that it can be either a solid or a, or a liquid of course uh, for a gas it will be a bit more difficult so it can be whatever solid that you want whatever uh, liquid that you want as long as it's compatible with the enzyme uh, in the sense that the enzyme will work optimally at the particular condition of um, interest Okay, so um, simple apparatus, a simple workout, better productivity, and due to ha um, high concentration of tolerance. Okay, so obviously, why do I why does it say it's high concentration of tolerance? Is because if the enzyme works at pH six, then definitely whatever you want to do, you will do it in pH six. Okay, because you can control the environment, so you you will definitely do it in pH six. Therefore, it will be high concentration tolerant and thus producing a lot of products. Okay? It will be very easy to control, very easy to do it. It can simply be in a beaker, you just put it in, change, um, um, prepare the buffer, make sure the buffer is pH 6, for example. You just chuck it in the uh, enzyme and you chuck it in all the reactants, uh, reagents that you want. And after a while, you stir it. After a while, you can analyze whether you have the product or not. Okay? Very simple. However, the cons is. Um, some enzymes requires a cofactor, therefore you need to do a recycling of cofactor, either recycling or you need to re-add the cofactor. Okay, so limited enzyme stability. So because it's outside of a cell, um, it will not be reproduced. Um, and towards the end of the day, the enzyme will will decompose over time. Okay, so it's, it's always uh, normal regardless of what you do, as long as it's outside of the cell, you can reproduce. Um, because to the end of the day, enzyme is made up of uh, peptide bond, and peptide bond can be hydrolyzed in um, any aqueous solution. So uh, whatever buffer that you are using, it can catalyze the hydrolysis of the enzyme, and to the end of the day, the stability of the enzyme is going to uh, be reduced over time. Okay. Um, you can make isolated the enzyme must be dissolved in water. Okay. So um, because no enzymes so far works um, in an organic um, solution, okay? Not like a metal catalyst that does work, uh, some metal catalyst, of course, um, but uh, for enzyme, it only works in uh, aqueous, so in water solution. So um, the pro is there will be a high enzyme activity. As long as it's in aqueous, it will be high enzyme activity. But the cons is side reaction is possible, um, again, this one relates to the specificity of the enzyme. So normally when an enzyme has an extracellular enzyme, 
they are less specific compared to uh, intracellular enzyme. Okay. So lipophilic substrate insoluble. So if you do, if the reaction catalyzes uh, a lipid reaction, for example, so it will be very difficult because lipid does not dissolve in water. It forms a micelle or involves micelle and whatnot. Okay. So it's a bit constant there. And workups requires extraction. So to the end of the day, you need to do extraction, but you know, nonetheless, um, all reaction that you do, you need to do purification. Extraction can be part of a purification process. Okay. Suspended in um, organic solvent. Um, so suspended in organic solvent, uh, meaning that you might want to attach the enzyme into a solid support. So uh, solid material, you want to attach it, um, the enzyme here. Uh, why do you want to do it? Well, for one thing, uh, you can control the hydration process and um, it will be easily kind of like if the enzyme are no longer reactive, you can just take it out, um, put it in aqueous again, try and um, rebuild the um, hydration layer. Um, sometimes you can regenerate the enzyme, of course, sometimes you can't, um, so that you can, you can try and regenerate and then once you regenerate, you can reuse it again. Okay. But if it can be suspended in organic solvent, it will be easy to perform. It will be easy work up. Um, because if it's an organic solvent, then uh, the easiest way is you can just take out the uh, solid support like this. Okay. And what you have in the solution is just either your reactants, your byproduct, and your product. So you can just take it. If it's an organic solvent, you can just rotate it. It will be very quickly evaporate all the solvents and you get your um, roughly pure product. Okay. Of course, you need to do purification. Right, um, but the cons is is reduced activity. As I mentioned, enzyme likes to work in aqueous environment due to the reasons that the stability of enzyme that we uh, look through. Okay, uh, redox reactions is severely impeded. Um, again, because um, aqueous environment, um, it's more stabilized. We have structural water that can uh, that might actually participate in the reaction as well. Okay. Um, and also, isolated enzymes, it will be easily immobilized. So, enzyme recovery is very easy. Um, you can regenerate, you can reuse. However, the cons is loss of activity during immobilization. So, um, say for example, if the enzyme is like that, okay, but then the only place by which you can uh, immobilize the enzyme is at this area. Okay, and then you have all this chunk um, solid support. Of course, because of the um, lo the location is rather quite near, so um, the reactants might be sterically hindered to enter the active set active site. That's one thing. The second thing you need to, if you go back and recall our inhibition lecture, okay, so there could be an inhibition going um, that that is causing a lower activity once you actually attach this link together. Okay, so that, those are the, the cons that, that is related to immobilization of enzyme. But again, it doesn't mean that all enzymes that is being immobilized will have a lower activity. No, um, but that can be one of the um, cons of uh, using an isolated enzyme in a immobilized form. Okay, a whole cell, um, on the other hand, it can be, this one is any, is a general factor. It can be a growing culture, it can be a resisting cells, it can be uh, immobilized cells. So um, in a cell growth, there's three phases. Okay, So growing, um, this is a growing culture. That's the first one. A resting state for the enzyme. Um, and immobilized um, cell is more, more or less like this theory okay, up here. You have a solid support and then you try and immobilize the cell on a solid support. More difficult i have never used it before but you know the theory, the theory is there and perhaps the the um, application is there okay so let looks at the pro and cons for a whole cell um generally um no cofactor recycling is necessary because again it's a cell so you can regenerate whatever is needed as long as the buffer contains all the required in, uh, ingredient then it can always regenerate so no enzyme purification is required um, because yeah, the enzyme is already inside the cell, so you do not need to purify it before you can use it. Right? However, the cost is expensive equipment. Okay? You need to have a specialized equipment to actually control the cell so that it will stop at one point. And then if you want to use that one, of course, you need to control it so that 
it stops or if it's in a growing phase you need to make sure that it's keep on on growing okay imagine if you just grow it in a beaker at one point the beaker will be saturated so the cell will no longer grow it will move to a sec, uh, second phase which is the um, stagnant phase and thus it might not express the enzyme anymore okay so you cannot do it therefore normally you will use a bioreactor like this by which the bioreactor can um, be used to always extract out um, some volume and at the same time you can add in more volume so the growing phase is always or almost always constant um, tedious workup due to large volumes, low product productivity due to lower concentration of tolerance. Again, it's a cell. So uh, even if the enzyme can work at pH 2, it doesn't guarantee that the cell can also work at pH 2. And also, um, in temperature-wise, depending on the cell that you use, some cell, if you take it from a human body, then the, working, the optimal working temperature is, is about 37. But if you take a cell from uh, the deep in the ocean uh, near a volcanic um, area, so the temperature requirement might be about 50 or 60 degrees Celsius. Okay, so depending on the cell that you use, um, you do need to have a lot of optimization. Okay, for a growing culture, normally it's higher activity because it's still growing. Okay, so there's, there's a lot of activities going on to the cell. So if the enzyme is part of the growing activity, then yes, it will be very easy to actually use it. But once it stops growing, then the enzyme might not might might no longer be expressed by the cell, and thus the reaction that you wanted might um, be reduced. Okay. So large biomass and enhanced metabolism, more byproducts, uh, process control difficult. So these are generally because it's a cell, there's a lot of processes going on, so there are definitely a lot of byproducts. There's a lot of biomass, so whatever you need. Biomass can also mean that because um, it's a growing cell, so you need to have, uh, as I mentioned, you need to remove some of the solvent, you need to add more, more reactants, reagents, medias, and whatnot. So the biomass, the, the, the total things that you need, um, is more in comparison to if you just use an isolated enzyme. Okay? Um, lower concentration tolerance, as I mentioned, low tolerance of organic solvent. Yes, it's a cell. Uh, oh, sorry, we are reading about this one. So, more byproduct process control is more difficult. Okay, it's, it's just growing. So, resting cell, on the other hand, work up is easier because it's uh, the cell is no longer growing. So, it will be easier for you to like process because, for one thing, um, the enzyme is being expressed by the cell, it's not being reduced. It's a stagnant process. It's kind of like how you are sleeping, okay? Um, or, or if if for the Muslim or for those who actually fast, um, when you fast, sometimes you feel like your your body is lack of energy. So what your body is trying to do is to reduce the amount of energy being used, um, so that you can last longer. Okay. So similarly, when a cell enters the uh, steady state, it there's a lot of um, processes that is being um, what do you call it I can't remember the terminology but it is being suppressed uh, it's being slowed down okay so reduce metabolism okay reduce metabolism suppress same thing uh, fewer byproducts because it's no longer uh, growing so less um, enzyme less catalytic activity less activity less byproduct okay but the cons is low activity because it, it, it's no longer growing so uh, the activity will be lower Okay. Um, in contrast, for immobilized cell, cell can be reduced. Uh, cell reuse is possible. Doesn't mean that you can. It, it is possible. Um, but to the end of the day, it lowers the activity. So um, this is uh, an option that uh, people normally do not choose. Okay. So um, I think basically that's it. Um, I will just take one or two minutes more. Okay. So uh, this slide is just recapping what this course is all about okay so at the end of this course uh, especially for for my section okay students should be able to classify natural products according to structure and metabolic pathway so this one is very general uh, in a sense that if you know the enzyme does oxidation uh, of course you do not you do not need to memorize every single thing it will be like uh, quiz number one where i ask uh, p450 is an oxidation enzyme 
So which of these reaction is an oxidation process? So those are the things that you need to um, understand. And I hope that based on your previous knowledge, first year, second year, um, you can actually try and relate back to uh, the processes to the enzymatic reaction. Okay. Um, second one, apply appropriate extraction and separation process method for natural products. So again, this is um, a summary, basically um, the steps that I mentioned previously, as long as you can understand it by heart, then there's no issue in the sense of what are the steps of the processes. And number four, illustrate the use of biochemical and biotechnological methods in chemistry. So um, we will look into that one since we don't have enough time next week. Okay, so we'll, we will use that last week um, to look into slight differences between bi biochemical and biotechnological approaches in chemistry, um, some examples, and, and hopefully by then it will be um, enough for you guys to either do a quiz um, on week 13, and then we can discuss on the quiz on week 14, or um, on week 13 you can do more tutorials, and then on week 14 we will just do a quiz. Okay, so I'll leave you guys to decide on whether to do quiz on week 13 or week 14. Um, I don't mind either, either all because I already have the, the questions ready. Okay. And um, that's all from me. Thank you. Um, happy new year. And, and um, see you guys next week. Take care. Uh, doctor. Yes, Regina. Actually, right, uh, from the last week's lecture notes, I think you skip some because we stop at inhibition. Enzyme inhibition. Let's see. Um, when I have inhibition is here. Yeah. Uh, after that, we have activity, right? Enzyme activity. Oh, okay. So I think I I read just that. All right. So I'll cover that one next week as well. Okay. Thanks, okay. Regina, for letting me know. Thank you, doctor. Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you, Doctor. Thank, thank you, doctor. doctor. Thank you, Doctor.